good morning good afternoon according wherever you are uh, dear all colleagues and friends uh, this webinar is the first i think webinar with with anterior segment uh, today we are having a, a, a very um, what we call high rank of speakers uh, from different places of the world we are honored to have all of them and to share their experience and knowledge with us uh, we are having actually today um, two sessions one session is ocular surface disease and the other one is um, uh, glaucoma and we are going to start with the uh, uh, ocular surface disease and we are having dr mazen and dr khalid al -Hafid. before we start just i want to give a little bit hint for all our attendees please um, if you have any problem you, there is a, a, a mobile number with whatsapp uh, in the invitation uh, you can just send a uh, whatsapp uh, and they will answer you if you have a problem to connect with us uh, if anyone want to ask a question he can send uh, there is a, a button down you can see it also there is a question and answer so you can send your question if someone who want also to uh, uh, to talk or to have an audio and discussion uh, or ask directly to the speakers just he can uh, have, he will have a uh, raised hand, uh, he will see it down, then we will find this one, then we will open, we'll mention the name uh, of the one who raised the hand, then we will give him uh, the mic to ask the questions. Uh, if there is any, any problem or you cannot connect also, you can just contact uh, uh, our uh, management events through the WhatsApp, as I mentioned. And also we are having a YouTube live so anyone who is facing a problem, he can just go and follow up, uh, follow us, sorry, in, uh, in, in YouTube. Um, we will start the first presentation with uh, my dear friends, Dr. Mazen uh, Sinjab. Uh, Dr. Mazen Sinjab uh, is a consultant of pharmac surgeon, a refractive surgeon with care, eye center and hospital, Dubai UAE. He is going to give a, a talk about role of inflammation in ocular surface disease. Uh, the mic with you, Dr. Mazen. I advise other colleagues just to be mute, please, all other speakers. So, Dr. Mazen, you can start now. Thank you very much. Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Is my screen uh, clear to all? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Bismillah. Good evening, everybody. I want to thank Dr. Al Amri for inviting me to this nice meeting and um, amongst uh, such excellent uh, speakers. And I want to thank Allergan for hosting this meeting as well. And I want to disclose that Allergan Company has asked me to highlight the importance of restasis in the treatment of ocular surface disease. So I'm going to share my experience with you in the following 10 minutes. There are three main components in the pathophysiology of ocular surface disease. Nerve damage, especially after ocular, surf after ocular surgeries, such as refractive surgeries and cataract surgery, goblet cell damage and inflammatory cascade. And usually there is a mixture of the three components in every ocular surface disease. However, there are two main categories under the name of ocular surface disease. The dry eye disease characterized by hyperosmolarity of the tear foam and the other ocular surface diseases characterized by normal tear osmolarity. But what if one of the other ocular surface diseases such as anterior blepharitis is associated with hyperosmolarity? The answer is, this is very common as those other ocular surface diseases may lead to dry eye disease if not appropriately treated. In other words, as long as tear osmolarity is normal, dry eye disease cannot be the diagnosis. And that's the definition of the dry eye disease by the tfos juice 2 report, which classifies the dry, dry eye disease into aqueous deficiency dry eye disease and evaporative dry eye disease. And in most of the cases of dry eye disease, these two entities participate, but in different percentages as shown in this vicious circle. So how to differentiate dry eye disease from other ocular surface diseases by measuring T 
تفسير اوزمولاريتي هايبر اوزمولاريتي and therefore the drive is when the osmolarity equals or above 308 milliosmol per liter or there is a difference of 8 milliosmol per liter or above uh, a difference between both eyes okay now to measure the severity the severity of the um, inflammatory cascade of the ocular surface disease the mmp9 uh, should be measured now the MMP9 is a, cytoco is a cytokine which is produced by the epithelium, damaged epithelial cells in case of inflammation. As you see in this figure, as you notice, I'm using the word, the severity of the inflammation rather than the presence and absence of inflammation because inflammation exists in all types of ocular surface disease but to be significant and detectable by the test, the MMP9 level should be 40 nanogram or more. The severity can be estimated by the presence and absence of the pink line as shown in this figure. Usually we wait for 10 minutes to decide. In very severe cases, the pink line appears very quickly within three to five minutes and will be in dark color. Now, because I am still a young grandfather, I'm following the recommendations of the American Academy of Ophthalmology for Young Ophthalmologists. The AAO recommends 10 pills in the management of the ocular surface disease that I'm going to share with you. First one, we have to listen to the patient properly. Do not rush to the exam. The symptoms that the patient suffers from can be the clue to the correct diagnosis and the best management. Examine the patient before looking behind the sleep lamp. Look at the skin, look at the lid, look for signs of rosacea. Notice how frequent the patient blinks and look for lid laxity and floppy eyelids. Always check corneal sensation. A neurotrophic cornea can be both the cause and the consequence of chronic ocular disease. And in many cases, it is overlooked. Use vital staining to examine the cornea, conjunctiva, and lid margins. Do not forget, this is an essential tool in the screening before refractive and cataract surgery. Be suspicious if you have, uh, if the patient has superior staining in the cornea. You have to think of the leading four causes of superior staining. They are the floppy changes of the liberal conjunctiva, superior limbic keratoconjunctiva, induced limbal stem cell deficiencies, as in this figure. As you see, this is a stem cell deficiency associated. It shows a message that my internet connection is not stable. Uh, is everything is clear? Yes, uh, it's clear. We yeah. are having some uh, little bit, uh, sometimes we are missing your voice. I think maybe you, you are, okay, you can continue anyway. It's okay. We can, we can. Okay. okay, so as you see here, it is stem cell deficiency associated with the chronic use of contact lens uh, because of the contact lenses. All right, now, of course, you have to emphasize and provide clear instructions to the patients about lid hygiene. Now you have to use the anti-inflammatory therapy um, as early as possible. We have to remember that inflammation plays a role in every form of the ocular surface diseases. We usually start with a short course of mild steroids and start topical cyclosporine drops concomitantly. Even if you plan to perform punctal occlusion, inflammation should be well controlled before. Otherwise, the inflammation will be exacerbated. Minimize preservative toxicity. And here, I want to highlight that most of the available anti-glaucoma medications are not preservative free and should be taken for a long time. So we have to use preservative free or at least benzalcohol Conium chloride free medications whenever possible. 
use tetracycline-based drugs at a lower dose. There is enough evidence to indicate that medications such as, such as doxycycline cannot be used. Uh, the child, child voice is not from my side. <laughs> Is it from your side, Dr. No. Mazen? No, it's not. So who is still not mute? I am in the hospital. I don't have the children with me. OK, <laughs> you can continue. All right, so uh, again, we have to use tetracycline-based drugs at a lower dose. I want to emphasize on the lower dose. There is enough evidence to indicate that medications such as doxycycline can be useful for the management of meibomian gland disease at much lower doses than previously thought. That will improve compliance by minimizing the side effects, particularly gastrointestinal side effects. Finally, patients and to be persistent. It is essential to tell the patient that such diseases can be controlled but rarely cured, and to tell them to be patient as treatment is in the long run. And I want to add appeal number 11, which is to, <clears throat> sorry, which is to train ourselves to use a questionnaire for evaluation and follow-up. One of the best questionnaires is the OSDI. Now I'm going to present two cases of dry eye disease treated by restasis. And the first one is 48 year old female came with chronic dryness, on and off redness, irritation, on and off blurring of vision. Her vision was 2020 with hair glasses and there was no systemic diseases. Now what I usually do in approaching a patient suffering from ocular surface disease symptoms, I do corneal staining, I measure the tear film breakup time and if available with the non-invasive uh, tear film uh, breakup time, I test a Schirmer test. I use the questionnaire or SDI and I measure the MMP9. Now, as you see, this is the corneal staining. There is no corneal staining, but as you see, the tear film breakup time is very, very short. And by measuring the tear film breakup time by the M um, MS39 machine, it is non-invasive. It is very, very low. Schirmer test showed seven millimeters in the right eye and eight millimeters in the left eye. And this is the uh, ocular surface disease index before starting the treatment. It gave 18 out of 11 questions answered. So this is the color uh, code indicator, which shows that the patient, according the, to the questionnaire, suffers from moderate to severe uh, uh, dry eye disease or symptoms of dry eye disease. I put the patient on restasis for six months. Then I repeated the tests. As you see here, this is the non-invasive tear film breakup time before and after. There was a huge improvement. Uh, however, Schirmer test showed no improvement. The results were almost the same as before. And this is the OSD. I hear an echo now. I can hear an echo now. Any problem? Hello. Okay. Hello. I can go on. Okay. So um, this is the uh, OSDI before the treatment, as I told you, it was 18 out of 11. Now after the treatment, it improved to nine out of 11. So this was the indicator before the treatment. It was and it became mild after treatment. The other case is 32 year old male came with chronic dryness, redness in most of the time, fluctuating 2020 unaided vision, and there was no systemic diseases. I did the same steps, corneal staining, non-invasive tear, tear film breakup time, Schirmer test, ocular surface disease index, MMP9. This was uh, corneal staining before starting the treatment, very severe punctate erosions, and Schirmer test showed five millimeters in the right eye and eight millimeters in the left eye. This was the 
OSDI before the treatment, it was 29, as you see, look at the bottom of the uh, slide, you will see 29 out of 10 questions answered. So according to the indicator, he, uh, he was suffering from severe ocular surface disease. Now I put him on uh, restasis for six months, and then I repeated the uh, tests, as you see, this is the staining before and after the treatment. There was a huge improvement in the um, corneal surface, as you see, just remaining few points, few punctate erosions in the center of the, of the, of the cornea within the palp palpebral area. Now, again, Schirmer test was almost the same as in the first patient. And this is the OSDI before the treatment. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you will find 29 out of 10 questions answered. It became eight, only eight out of 10 questions answered. So the indicator showed, the indicator showed a very good improvement from severe, almost severe to mild to moderate uh, symptoms. So in conclusion, the OSDI is a very good tool to give you an idea about the symptoms that the patient is suffering from and for follow-up as well, because some tests may not show um, improvement such, a, sorry, such as Schirmer test. Second, restasis could improve symptoms and signs of, of, uh, of the dry eye disease and OSDI. Uh, OSD, uh, the uh, Schirmer test may remain abnormal despite the improvement. Now, before I stop, I want to show you this study that was published and I found it uh, in the internet. Um, it highlights the importance of uh, like a second trial of uh, restasis because some, some patients may not respond to the first trial or to the first six months. So uh, the perspective uh, shows that we can try again restasis in patients who did not respond to the first trial. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nazem, for uh, this uh, comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, if there's any questions, already Dr. Nazem, he took uh, more time, but anyway, no problem, because he's the first speaker we can. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Mazen, please. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mazen, do you, I mean, what is your protocol? Um, do you put the patients on, uh, on recesses only, or you put the patients with some also other uh, medications. So what is your uh, control here in treating these two patients? Yeah, great. Now, uh, because these two patients did not have any other problems such as, for example, blepharitis or uh, other causes of ocular surface diseases, I did not use any. I just gave uh, like a short uh, uh, period of uh, steroids, uh, like for two weeks, just to control the uh, discomfort. And then uh, I continued only with the restasis and the lubricant. But in general, if I have any, any patient and they, they have uh, other uh, pathologies such as meibomian gland dysfunction, blepharitis, uh, um, uh, of course, I have to treat uh, vigorously those uh, pathologies uh, in addition to giving the restasis. Do you, do you, do you uh, see any uh, after cessation of the uh, restasis, the reversibility of the symptoms and if you discontinue after six months, some of the symptoms will come back or you think yes. it's... Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, let's say very roughly, very roughly in about 30, 30 percent of patients, uh, they got the, their symptoms back. Part, part of the symptoms, not all the, the symptoms, of course. One other question as well. I mean, in the UK, we haven't got uh, Zidra yet or Lifetograst. Uh, any experience of using uh, Lifetograst in similar sort of cases? No, not yet. Hmm. I, I don't think we have it in the UAE as well. Not yet, not yet, not yet, no. Okay, uh, okay Dr. Mazen, um, how long you are using, for example, the, I mean, the cyclosporine? Uh, did you continue only for six months, then re-evaluate, or you are continuing more than that? Uh, actually, in most my cases, I, uh, I usually only one, um, I use only one course, which is for six months. Now, um, 
as I mentioned before, about 30%, they had their symptoms, some or part of their symptoms back. I tried to avoid using restasis again because, you know, the insurance usually rejects expensive to have it as cash. I try my best to use um, by changing the lubricants, maybe uh, by changing the lifestyle, uh, giving more instructions, uh, see if the patient has non-compliance, like this. I try to avoid using a second course because of those two reasons. Uh, okay, so now I think we are already a little bit late. Uh, so we can just move to the next uh, speaker, my dear Dr. Uh, Khalid uh, al arfaj Associated Professor uh, and Chairman of Ophthalmology Department, uh, Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University in Damam, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Dr. Khalid, he will give us uh, cases uh, based for discussion on ocular surface disease. Dr. Khalid, my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for uh, the kind uh, I mean, Mazen, yeah, please. Uh, give me the the uh, yes, the share point. Okay, now we can go to the hall. Mm, share just. Mm. Is everything goes okay now? Yes, just okay. Now make it the whole slides. Great. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed Al-Amri, for uh, inviting me for uh, this uh, meeting. It's really our pleasure, my pleasure, to uh, be uh, with the esteemed doctors uh, this evening to present some um, of the uh, anterior segment cases. Actually, I was asked to uh, present an interesting cases in the uh, ocular surface diseases as well as the anterior segment, and I choose these uh, two cases to um, uh, present and discuss. Uh, many of the anterior segment uh, surgeons uh, faced some of the uh, hopeless cases or very high risk uh, coronary blindness, I call it. So like this case, uh, um, um, grafted patients with coronary vascularization and patients came uh, all over here and there and they are asking for uh, a hope to restore their uh, vision and you are uh, having some sort of um, uh, hope, but you don't want to give the patient uh, the, 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 the most of the hope. Sometimes you might have some frustrations of uh, these kind of cases. These all of my uh, cases uh, presented to me and they have done um, different uh, procedures for, the, for them and some of them they received the uh, keratoprosthesis. So let's just see this uh, patient is a 45 years old female a head nurse in uh, one of the uh, private uh, hospitals um, in Eastern province in Saudi Arabia, uh, hit it by a chemical um, uh, and received a very bad trauma, bad chemical trauma, and presented to us with a very severe uh, rigidity of vision, um, both eyes, um, duration of, of almost uh, three uh, months, and we treated her to calm down the chemical injury, then, uh, she ended up with the uh, almost light uh, perception with the um, good projection. There was no history of systemic disease like diabetes or hypertension. Uh, as I mentioned, the patient was having a vision of light perception with a good projection in the left eye. We uh, uh, this diagnosed her with a very severe uh, um, generalized fibrosis with cloid formation with deep vascularization. So the we, we I mean, uh, discussed the things with her and she uh, agreed to have um, a very special procedure that had its own risks. That is the uh, Boston keratoprosis type one. As you are seeing the surgery, there is very bad uh, vascularization and uh, keloid formation as well as fibrosis. Um, I mean, even the, the configuration and the anatomy of the eye was not clear until we removed all of the fibrosis and uh, vascularization, I mean, uh, fibrous tissue of, above the eye. Then we identified the eye, then we did the uh, trephination. We usually, uh, with the keratoprosis, use of uh, um, 8.75 trephination in the donor. We usually also uh, take off the lens to implant the uh, 
um, um, Boston keratoprosis. We do also vitrectomy at the end of the procedure. This is the last uh, ended uh, picture, and this is the post-op uh, um, exam. Should the patient improve the vision from light perceptions to 2100 in the first uh, uh, one month? In the last follow-up four, year, four years post the uh, surgery, the vision is still maintained with the 2060 vision with uh, anti-glaucoma medications and, and uh, also uh, um, lubricants and some uh, on and off uh, steroid. This is the first um, presentation of, uh, at the clinic and this is the, uh, the, the last uh, follow-up. She had well established, I mean, well received um, um, Boston keratoprosis seeing with it, with a narrow visual field, but uh, very uh, a viable uh, vision. Another uh, patient uh, was almost. Farid, can we just interrupt you about this case? Uh, if one has a question, but uh, I have one question for this uh, patient. Uh, the other eye, how is the other eye? Uh, the, the other eye was 2200 uh, um, with a mild to moderate chemical injury. So it was not one eye patient actually, but that. I mean, this is the situation of the other eye. She was 2100 with the with correction 2080 or 2060 at the maximum. She did not okay. receive any uh, procedure in that eye. But already the patient improved in this most affected the, yeah, up, 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 up. than the other one, right? Yeah, this is the affected eye. This is the left eye. Right eye was, was not bad at all. I mean, 2060 with correction. And uh, um, with the with the lubricants, and at the beginning of the chemical injury, we give her uh, the uh, uh, needed uh, uh, steroid as uh, well as other measures. So uh, it's it it very severe uh, chemical injury was in one eye. That is the left eye. Is there any protocol, Dr. Khalid? You are using, I mean, to select how you select this kind of patient that you are going to do on this patient or not to do. What is the, the things that you are taking? Yeah, I mean, I mean yes, I, I agree with you. This is really a dilemma to uh, see if the, if the patient will uh, tolerate or not tolerate the, this kind of procedure. It was really a risky decision, I agree with you. But um, um, the light projection and the absence of systemic diseases, absence of retinal problems, absence of the also glaucoma, uh, uh, particularly, uh, is one of the also uh, favoring uh, the results of uh, such patient. Uh, but why you have to be tricked to me, I mean, in this case? Uh, because we do uh, ethical type of Boston keratoprosis that necessitate to uh, do the trick to me. Uh, Dr. Mazin, do you have any comment or any question on this? Or any other colleagues he want to ask Dr. Khalid about this case? Okay, so we can uh, proceed to uh, the next case. Then we are having a five questions we are going to raise after you finish the okay. case. So another case of 72 years old female presented also to the, our uh, clinic uh, after being illegally blind because this patient is a one-eyed patient. Uh, there was no systemic diseases and the vision in the right eye was uh, no light perception with uh, thesis. In the left eye, the patient was a light uh, perception with good projection as superior and temporal and was equivocal in, at nasal and inferior quadrants. Uh, the IOP and the right eye was a thesis, very low, and in the left eye was uh, 18. In the left eye has very severe corneal scar, cannot be, uh, you cannot assess even the, uh, the anterior chamber, the beast can reveal normal retina as well as choroid and optic disc. I'll show you the uh, surgery uh, after we uh, do the uh, 6.5 trephination on the, uh, uh, the patient cornea. We unfortunately see this picture. You see the uh, very ischemic iris uh, obliterating the uh, visual axis. You, can, you cannot even uh, see and uh, hiding um, um, a white cataract actually. So the, the so some of the anterior uh, segment or cornea surgeons, they don't know what's happening uh, after they do the uh, 
the um, um, telephonation. They don't know what's 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 going on there. So I want just to speed up. We do the uh, trip and flu, and this um, uh, white cataract. We created a like pupil here, and we want to minimize the and in, the uh, interruption of the uh, iris because everything is ischemic. If you touch the iris, might you can shred it with you. So uh, that's uh, the unedited uh, version of the uh, uh, of the video, and we do the capsular capsulotomy type. Everything is out, and now we try to deliver the uh, mature cataract. Okay, so basically after that, we uh, do the um, um, IOL implantation. We clean up everything and we put the IOL, then we put the graft. This is part of the capsule. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, do uh, the suturing of the uh, graft. Fortunately, uh, the patient tolerated that we did it uh, just two years ago to the last follow-up the patient uh, was controlled without much of problems with a very viable uh, vision so this is the end of the procedure that's it so as i told you the post-op the vision improved from light perception to 2100 with correction the two years ago after the surgery, two years now, the vision corrected up to 2100. So as a conclusion, we never want to, uh, give, to give up from the uh, hopeless cases, especially for those patients of having very high risk of coronary blindness. There are some viable options like the penetrating keratoplasty with other measures like um, Ahmed valve if, if needed or the kinacort injection to uh, decrease the chance of rejection or even the Boston uh, keratoprosthesis. But we need a very careful follow-up for these patients because the, there are some uh, others um, uh, complication could uh, be seen in the uh, follow-up uh, appointments. Thank yeah, you. I have a question, Dr. Khalid. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid. Okay, Dr. Uh, Mazen, you can go ahead, ask the question. Uh, yeah, did you evaluate uh, the second case by UBM before proceeding? Yes, we did the B scan. Usually, this is a um, this is our usual to do B scan. B scan or U UBM? No, I didn't do uh, a UBM. I think UBM will will elaborate and give us uh, an idea about the uh, anterior chamber much more than the B scan. But uh, at that time, we were not having a, a UBM at our institute, and uh, we uh, depend on the uh, B scan as well as the light light uh, projection. This patient was uh, legally blind, uh, was guided by uh, their relative, and and uh, so many cornea surgeons was refusing to touch the patient. Uh, but the uh, light projection was equivocal, and we take the risk, and we ended up uh, in a favorable, uh, actually, uh, results. Yeah, but my, my concern is about the peripheral sinicae. Um, as we saw that there was uh, like uh, atrophic uh, iris, and for sure there were some adhesions, anterior adhesions. So um, don't you uh, think the, that the, the, sometimes- The was measured that time before surgery when I was 18. Yeah. And as far as I remember, the patient was, um, the, the pressure of the patient was not, uh, I mean, increased even up to the last visit. So I think you, if you, if you see the atrophic iris, Yes, I agree, M might be some sort of adhesions and uh, cyanechia in some part of that trabecular mature, but it seems to be some other parts is really open and, and things are uh, doing well. Even, I don't remember the patient has even needed any integral coma because the pressure was uh, with the normal, uh, even post-operatively. No, uh, the, the point I, that I want to highlight is whenever we have anterior cyanechia with 
normal eye pressure, we may have phthisis bulby later on because these anterior sinicae are compensating. So this is why I'm highlighting the importance of UBM to be yeah. sure whether the angle was fully uh, closed or was. I mean, if you have seen the uh, cornea, well, cornea is very, but uh, amazing case. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Can I make a brief comment? Doctor, Doctor Tarak, Fadal. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, with Doctor Mazen that uh, looking at the iris, uh, the way I'm seeing it, there's no chance that there's no sinicia that is very aggressive, and uh, the only way that the pressure is well controlled with no uh, topical anti-glaucoma medication is that there's a ciliary body atrophy that is significant. This is the only way I can explain that, because what I see does not go with uh, with 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 open angles anywhere. Thank you. And this is the importance of your presence, uh, like the anti-glaucoma. I mean, the glaucoma surgeons, they have their own opinion. I, uh, I usually take the glaucoma uh, problem as very, very uh, cautiously because this is one of the uh, uh, problems we see both uh, Boston keratoperiosis as, as well as the PKP. And they might even lose their vision because of the uh, of the uncontrolled uh, pressure. But um, uh, fortunately, this patient maybe have severe body shut down and the pressure was really controlled without even any, one anti-glaucoma uh, medication. This is one of the uh, important uh, measures we are seeing every follow-up appointment. Uh, thank okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khaled, for this uh, um, very interesting uh, uh, cases, actually as we agreed. Uh, and thanks for uh, Dr. Maz and Dr. Park for their comment. Actually, I have um, uh, several uh, comments uh, and questions. Just I'm searching to go back. Is, I am there with you. Hello? Yeah. There is a question. How to maintain the keratoprosis yes, uh, uh, for the first time? Yes. I mean, yes. uh, so far, um, I have almost 22 cases of uh, Boston keratoprosis, and not all of them very, very successful, but some are very successful. Uh, this is one of the uh, very good uh, cases we have. Uh, to, uh, the, the most important of Boston keratoprosis problems are glaucoma, and if you have a problem with the ocular surface, you might have extrusions or melting. So keeping the ocular surface very wet with um, lubricants as well as even contact lens might increase the success rate as well as the uh, duration of, of the uh, retention rate of the, of the Boston keratoprosis. Keeping the patients in anti-glaucoma if needed, keeping uh, the patients on the steroid because of vitritis and mild vitritis also could uh, present any time for surgery. Uh, keeping the patient because of they even have risk of, of uh, infection. Uh, on Vigamox. Indefinitely, we, we put the patients in anti glaucoma if needed or uh, steroid and, and antibiotic. This is simply how to maintain the. Uh, the Dr. Tarek with us. Dr. Tarek with us here. Dr. Tarek Sharawi. Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Because I don't know, I, I feel there is some uh, something. I have done a problem in my laptop. It's not a problem of connection. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Dr. Khaled, uh, for your uh, cases. Uh, and actually, now we want to uh, to move to. Uh, uh, I will apologize from my dear colleagues. They are asking questions. There are so many think... questions actually here, but if yeah, there Dr. is Khaled, time, uh, we can, can delete it later. Yeah, can we just answer it later? That's why I'm yes. saying let us do later on. Um, so we will start with the Dr. Uh, Tarek uh, Sharawi now, I uh, will be asking to shift to a glaucoma. Uh, Dr. Tarek uh, is a professor of ophthalmology, University of Geneva, and president of the International Society of Glaucoma Surgery. Uh, and he is a well-known uh, uh, esteemed uh, speakers and uh, of consultant ophthalmologist in uh, glaucoma. So he will give us a two cases or one case presentation and we'll discuss with him. Uh, Dr. Tarek, please, uh, Michael. Thank you very much. I will just share my screen. One second. Uh, okay, let's do that. 
Okay. Can you see? Can you see that well? Can you see my slides? Yes. Very good. Okay. So I'll just adjust it like that and then start. Okay. So um, it, it's a pleasure to be with you. I enjoying very much listening to my colleagues. It's a, it's a great opportunity and a great learning opportunity for me to be with you here today. Um, I have a loads of respect to uh, to the panel that uh, that uh, that we have today, and uh, I've been asked to speak about glaucoma. I know that uh, Dr. Ali will, will will give a brilliant talk, and I try to stay away from from uh, regular glaucoma talks and, and appeal to something or speak to something that I hope would be appealing to general ophthalmologists uh, around the world that are listening to us. So my talk is centered about how to manage the patient's expectations. Um, our patients, when we, when we first tell them that they have glaucoma uh, and we first establish a contact with them and establish a relationship, it is, we have to agree that it's a traumatic experience when we diagnose a disease that they know very little about. So I'll take you through what I think is our important messages related to our patients, things related to how to manage their shock, what is the disease, the fears that they have, what kind of investigations, therapy in terms of drops with their compliance issues and with dryness, laser surgery and uh, a question of the future for our patients. So the first, first of all, the patients suffer from a, a severe trauma when you tell them that they have glaucoma. Up till recently, most people do not understand what's the difference between glaucoma and what's the difference, what, what is cataract. And it's very difficult for them to, to, to make some sense of, of what you're telling them. Uh, some patients will tell you, well, it's, I've heard that it's a disease that, it is, that is blinding. And immediately you have to manage this, this nightmarish scenario that the majority of glaucoma patients around the world can survive and live for the rest of their life with useful, useful vision and, and, uh, and a good quality of life. So please, when you diagnose the disease, it is very important to manage the patient's expectations and to manage the patient's fears when it comes to the idea of, of blindness. From there on, I think it's very important to explain to the patient that yes, pressure plays a role. And that's what this is what we are actually doing is to reduce pressure in most cases by different modalities because the pressure can is a, is a significant risk factor. But it is very important for me to explain to my patient that at the end of the day, it's a disease of the optic nerve. Explaining what an optic nerve is, a cable of a hundred of a 1.5 million fibers connecting the, the eyes to the brain. And this is what we are want to, to preserve. And the ultimate, you know, the ultimate uh, prize for your patient is to explain to them, to he or she, that what we are trying to do is to preserve the quality of, of, of life, not just the quality of vision, not just, we are not treating pressure, we're not, pre, we're not treating eyes, we are treating the human being and our job is to continue to offer them a good quality of life. Now, it's very important also because, you know, I, I, I'm always envious of, of retina surgeons and cornea surgeons because, you know, the disease is obvious, the patient doesn't see. And if you tell the patient, we need to go to the operating room now, they, they obey. But in glaucoma, patients do not understand the disease because they don't see it. Most of the cases are asymptomatic. As you can see here, this is a, a visual field with an image to explain to a patient what is normal vision. And this is to explain what a scotoma is and explaining as well that because of the plasticity of the brain, the patient will not be able to perceive that he, he or she is not able to see something. And I use those very, to, to a lot of use to explain to patients, for example, what is the disease, but also when do they have to stop driving? And I think this is always an important issue for our patients to, to explain and to, uh, to make with them difficult decisions. Now, patients are put in those copulas and they are bombarded with, with light and they have to press a button. And it is very important to our patients and to, their, to the degree of their uh, consciousness 
as they are actually uh, doing a test to explain why we are doing those tests and to explain that we are not just looking at one test, but we are looking for series of tests, as you can see here, to look at trend analysis and event analysis to evaluate if the patient is progressing or if the patient is not. I do not rely very much on gray scales, but I explain to patients very well with gray scales because it is the easiest thing for them to understand. Again, when we are doing OCTs or GDXs or HRTs or whatever imaging technology that we are using, uh, it is very important for our patients to understand why we're doing that and to explain that this is part of evaluation of the morphology of how their optic nerve looks. Patients react very well when you show them photos. So explain what an optic nerve is, explain what you have on your screen. Uh, I don't think that something like that is, is something to be hidden from the patient. In fact, this helps the patient a lot to understand and to become compliant. Then at one point on time, you put the patient on medications. And as, as uh, Dr. Mazen very eloquently explained, um, dry eyes can happen from many things, including anti-glaucoma medications. And for the first time, the patient becomes symptomatic. The patient is symptomatic, not because of glaucoma, he's symptomatic because of the dryness and all the, the itchy redness, you know, uh, uh, halos around the eye and, and all the complications that come with topical anti-glaucoma medications. And this is not something that you are going to avoid. This is a patient with some dry eye. And if you think that the patient with this dry eye would continue to take his medication or her medication for long, then you're kidding yourself. Once dry eyes develop, maybe patients will put some drops before he or she come to see you, but, but the compliance level drops significantly. Uh, we also have issues with older patients. If you're giving monodoses, please don't prescribe monodoses before you give one to the patients and test if she or he are able to uh, use those. A lot of those would come to our cornea surgeons with abrasions in their corneas because the patients are not very comfortable using them. Explain about the washout effect. If a patient has two drops and puts the second immediately after the first, all the first drop volume will be washed out of the eye. And patients have to be told that they need at least five minute interval between those devices. A lot of patients come and ask about lasers and we should be ready with good answers. One of the devices, one of the, the interesting thing about lasers is that, well, the, it is a surgical approach, but on the good side, it has a relatively low cost compared to medications and you have no issues with adherence or compliance. On the bad side, it's rare that we, we do a laser and the patient you know, lives happily ever after and continues to live without medications all the time. One of the interesting papers that came from the UK, uh, is, it's a randomized control trial comparing SLT to medication as a first line therapy. So patients who are recently diagnosed were put on medications or on SLT. And interestingly enough, patients on SLT did relatively well. They had a, a, a better quality of life and a better control of their medication, of their pressure compared to medication. So SLT is a valuable tool that we should use. If you are going to take the patient to uh, glaucoma surgery, to the operating room, you have to explain that it is not a, a benign procedure. It comes with a, a certain uh, increased risk of multiple complications, including loss of comfort for about 10% of our patients because of blebs and again, issues related to dry eyes increased risk of cataracts. Obviously, if the, if the glaucoma surgery has been complicated, the potential for cataracts increase significantly. But even in the best of hands, this is the tube versus TRAB trial, the TVT trial, which shows that after only one year, one third of patients lost two or more Snellen lines. So there is a certain degree of loss of vision that we have to be aware of and we have to discuss with our patients. It is not an easy procedure and it has its own positive points and the uh, negative points. Patients usually come with a question, will I go blind? Is it a downhill slope? Am I going to fi finish my life uh, in, a, in a state of, of blindness and loss of vision? Well, 
we used to tell our patients that if you take your medications well and everything and you do your duty the way it is supposed to be done, you are going to uh, have a situation that is similar to the situation that you're having now. So the best case scenario is stabilization of the situation. To be honest, uh, this is uh, challenged by, by papers like this one. And then you can see here, this, this is a, a, a very complicated evaluation of the um, visual field in the SIGITS trial in the collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study. And what you can see here is that about 15% of patients had an improved uh, vision in the first five in Uh, Dr. Tarek, you are with us. We cannot hear you now. Uh, we can have uh, a question till we get back to Dr. Tarek. I don't know why he is uh, disconnected from our from his side. Uh, Dr. Um, we can now, Mr. Owen, we can have Dr. Anuha for questions. You can give the mic for Dr. Nuha. Mr. Wei. One second, Doc. I'm looking for uh, the name. Yeah, the first one. The first one, we can get the, the first uh, questions. Nuha. One second, Doc. I'm looking for her name. Okay. Almost there. Please. And prepare the other one. Dr. Alama, Dr. Arif, Adinwala, Dr. Ahmed Hussain. So we'll have one one by one. Then we get back to Dr. Dr. Anuha is not here. Okay. Dr. Alama, Sharbat, please. Okay. Kindly approve, Dr. Lama. Dr. Lama, if you are you are hearing us, please you can just uh, uh, give your question. The mic with you, Dr. Lama. Dr. Lama. Okay, we can go to Dr. Arif, please, Dr. Arif. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, Dr. Mazin, I just wanted to ask you one question. The minimum age when you start these tests is I drop. In children's basically. Uh, can you just uh, decrease the voice behind you so we can hear you very well, Dr. Ar? Just talk with us from the mic that or the, you are using. Yeah. Please repeat the question. Dr. Arif? Is this is I drop. Sorry? When do you start restasis? Minimum age. Okay. Dr. Mazin, you can hear? Or Dr. Khalid, can you uh, answer this question? Dr. Khalid? Um, when, you, when you are starting, when did you start the restasis? Also, I mean, there are very rare cases of uh, dry eye among children. Let's agree with that. So, uh, and we don't, as uh, anterior sigma and cornea surgeons, deal with a dry eye in children much. But I, I, I think uh, we, we should go back to the uh, to the studies. I don't think there is much of studies uh, was done in restasis in children. 
uh, and I, I didn't think it's very, very safe. It's um, a virus foreign and uh, it's, it should be limited to the adults. But I, I, I'm not sure if there is very severe dry eye patients and children that needed uh, restasis. So uh, most of what we are uh, using for those, it's adults. And most of the studies even is recommending adults even for the uh, restasis. I don't have much of experience. I think in the UK, Bayaz, he's having a comment about this one yesterday. Yeah, in, the, in the UK, I see a lot of uh, vernal disease uh, in young yeah. patients. Uh, and we do have a uh, cyclosporin called Vocasia uh, that we use quite regularly. And it is licensed for use in children four times a day. It's the same as Icurvis. Uh, it's just branded differently, but it is licensed for use in children four times a day. And as a steroid sparing agent, it's it's absolutely excellent and almost vital. This uh, one is an anti-inflammatory, non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory or cyclosporin-like? Cyclosporin, cyclosporin. Cyclosporin. Yeah, these, these patients, instead of giving them, what we used to do is give them a lot of subtarsal triamcinolone injections, but with high dose topical steroid, good compliance, and four times a day cyclosporin. Um, you know, it, it works. It works quite well, very age, well. Age you are giving. What is what is the age that you can I think start? The youngest, I think the youngest I've given is about five or six. How five. much? Uh, how long do you give it for? Three months, six months? As long as it takes. I mean, all these sort of patients are very individual. Um, so it's all a question, a question of sort of tapering the steroid down and keeping them on vocasia. Sometimes you, you have to keep them on four times a day, sometimes once a day, sometimes alternate days. But this is where sort of seeing the patient and the art of, of judging the inflammation and compliance comes in. Thank I you. agree with Dr. Fayaz. I'm sorry, just to comment on this. I agree totally with Dr. Fayaz. This is another indication that not the dry eye, that's the variant keratoconjunctivitis. And usually we do the cyclosporin uh, if it's available at one percent. And if it's not available, we can't even give the restasis as a uh, adjunctive therapy with the steroid. The main, uh, the, the main safe treatment and the variant keratoconjunctivitis is the steroid. And we can give also the cyclosporins with that. But uh, I mean, you direct me with a dry eye. That's my, I, I, uh, I didn't, uh, uh, I mean, did you Dr. Martin, you have any comments? Can you yes. give a cyclosporin in children for yes. dry eye? Yes. 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 To be precise about the questions. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I give uh, what is the, the, the youngest that you can give? Um, there is a difference that I, I can give or that I have give, ever given to a patient. Actually, the youngest patient came with uh, keratoconjunctivitis Sika for me um, seven years. So I started the restasis with steroids both together. So, this so one you are giving especially for the keratoconjunctivitis Sika, but what about yes. the dryness? I'm talking if there is a dryness. No. Only dryness, I don't give restasis to children, no. I don't have evidence-based uh, support for that. Okay, I think this is the opinion of the Thank you. Okay, yes. so we can go, um, we have, uh, we can, if we can get uh, Dr. Tarek, or you can continue, please. Uh, you are mute, Dr. Tarek, can you open your mic, please, yes. Op no, open your yes. mic. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I, I don't need to put my last slide. I mean, I was almost finished when I was cut off, I think. Oh. Uh, my, my last message was very simple. Uh, recent studies show that if patients take their medications correctly, uh, especially if the pressure goes down to lower levels under 15, uh, it happens more among women and it happens more in surgically treated patients there is a chance of about 15 percent that there will be an improvement in visual field this is very interesting and for me this is a very it's a message of hope because instead of using the stick all the time and telling our patients if you don't take your medications you'll be blind we can now tell them if you take your medications there is a certain possibility of improvement and i think a positive reinforcement would be with probably be the best way to improve patient's compliance. With that, I thank you very much for uh, inviting me and I was honored to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Tarif. It's very interesting and very comprehensive, very good presentation, actually. Uh, and you tackle some uh, issue that we are all the time not, yeah, and we try to avoid this one, which is very important, especially uh, the patient, they are using the medication properly or not. Um, what is, the, I mean, how do you evaluate the risk that there will be, or you can convince a patient with glaucoma that he will be having an improvement? I mean, in the visual field or in the vision or quality of vision? In, or in, that... 
if you teach your patient well from the start that a glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve that affects the periphery of vision and can result in many cases into uh, a legal blindness, despite the patient seeing almost 100% from a, from a central vision, but with the concentric field deterioration, the patient is again, could be illegally blind. And you, if you explain that the quality of life of the patient depends on having a good visual field, reading, cutting something, going up a stair. If the patient is well educated into what is glaucoma, and then we explain that we what, what he or she or what we are both doing is leading to a, a preservation or even a bit of improvement in the visual field, and the patient is very perceptive to the concept because he's already well educated and to, to the idea of what is glaucoma. And the whole issue of, of convincing the patient depends on you taking the time to explain, to educate the patient to what is glaucoma. And to be very frank and honest with you, not everybody has the time to do that very comprehensively. In Geneva, we are very lucky because, because we have consultations for patients with our specialized nurses. So the nurses spend like 45 minutes per patient to explain what is, what is glaucoma, what is quality of life, and to improve the quality of life. And I think this is something, uh, it's an experience that I think a lot of, of centers that can, can do it and afford to do it, should be able to do to involve more nursing into uh, issues related to compliance. Uh, thank you very much. Is there any question or comment from uh, uh, dear colleagues here in the panel to Dr. Farah? Well, any question for Dr. Farah, Dr. Muhammad? Uh, Dr. Ali, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farah, for this pre nice presentation. One question you have heard this is uh, from the PVT study, there is decrease in uh, around two lines, and 33% and for the visual acuity. But if we look at the CIGT studies, the, the patient benefit uh, in advanced cases from uh, the surgery better than the uh, treatment. This is journal for journal fluctuation on the list, journal list IOB. There, is there any conflict between these two uh, studies? No, I don't think so. I think that the CIGT trial, when it speaks about, uh, you know, uh, medications versus surgery, a lot of studies, not just the CIGITS, but many other studies are showing that on the long run, the, the surgery does better for the patient if intraoperative complications can be avoided in general. But now the TVT actually took patients that are not terribly advanced and randomized them to trabeculectomy versus tube. And true, the, the potential for vision drop was 30% in both te techniques, not just because of cataracts, which happens a lot, but also because of hypotony and hypotony-related maculopathy and changes in, in, in refraction and changes in the ocular surface. So the, the, the message is, is simple. Glaucoma surgery can affect vision in a, in a good percentage. And I think it is very important for us to discuss that with our patients because you have to manage their expectations. If you take a patient in, and, and he drops a line or two, it is very traumatic for the patient. And he has to understand why he's doing the surgery. It is preventing further damage down the line, for example. I mean, the whole, what I'm trying, the message that I'm, I'm trying to pass on is nothing can be better than communicating with your patient in order to be able to manage the expectations and make the patient, you know, comfortable with what you're, what you're offering him or her. Thank you. Uh, we are having uh, uh, one question. He can give live question, Dr. Alama. Mr. John, if you can open the mic for Dr. Alama to ask her question, please. Yes, Dr. Muhammad. Yeah, Dr. Yes, Dr. Alama, you are on, uh, yes, on live, please, yes. Okay. Yeah. I just want to ask uh, Dr. Tariq uh, that he mentioned that uh, we should not uh, uh, multi, uh, give the patient multi drops, especially the elder patient to control uh, their uh, glaucoma. Oh, uh, I mean, when we can add another drop to the patient, we would depend on the ocular pressure or we would depend on the uh, result of OCT of the nerve and visual field. Uh, okay. It's, uh, I did not say that we are not supposed to give elderly patients multiple drops. I, uh, basically, what I said is if we're giving multiple drops, make sure that between each drop at least is five minutes. And I also mentioned, if I may, 
that monodosis for elderly patients is not always something that is easy to handle. I mean, at least in my population, a lot of my patients have, you know, atherosclerotic joints, and it's very difficult for them to manage with single doses. If I go deeper into your question and try to answer it as fast as possible, you start always with monotherapy for, for glaucoma, always in 99% of cases. And if, the pre if your target pressure range, I, mean, I, don't, I don't use a target pressure number, but if your target pressure range is not attained, you are then allowed to switch between classes or to, to add. That is, that is always a, a possibility now. But in general, we need to control pressure with the least number of drops, with the least number of molecules, and the least number of bottles. So the, if, you, if you give fixed combinations, it's obviously better than giving multiple multiple uh, yeah, you know sure. bottles yeah yeah okay um, so just we will have one from dr ahmed husban mr Junya, if he can open for dr ahmed to ask his question then after that we'll start with dr Fay, uh, Fayyad, uh for uh, his presentation then we can have another question later on yes dr ahmed if you, you can connect mr dr ahmed Assalamu alaikum. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dr. Tarek, I have two questions. One question uh, uh, What is the investigations uh, give us uh, to catch the earlier changes of nerve fiber loss? And the second question is the question uh, 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 sorry, about the. Uh, okay, you can't can think the other question till he answered the first question, Dr. Tarek, please. Okay, so the, I, I'm often getting the, this question of which uh, device gives us the earliest whatever. Now, uh, uh, my, my real and honest advice is remember that glaucoma is a, a puzzle board and you are connecting you know, pieces together. So your job is to get as much evidence as possible. And the evidence in terms of glaucoma comes from pressure, from pressure fluctuations, from pachymetry, from corneal thickness, from imaging of, of, of the disc, from disc photography and from visual field. Uh, if you're asking about which would give the first, uh, you know, the first signs of damage uh, of glaucoma, and glaucoma is a damage of the optic nerve, obviously, the answer is very simple. Some cases start with visual field damage. Some cases start with morphological damage. Classical teaching has been for many years that we always see something in the optic nerve and then we see visual field. Now this has been challenged like seven, eight years ago by a series of studies coming from multiple places, mainly in Malmö and in London. And, and uh, they, they showed beyond uh, you know, any shadow of doubt that some cases actually start with, with the early, earliest signs of damage in the visual field, followed by, by morphological changes or vice versa. So, I mean, which one does give us the thing? It could be this, it could be that. The simple answer is do everything, do a battery of investigations to be able to catch as many, you know, it's, it's a detective story. You need to catch whatever evidence that there is to be able to build your case uh, to treat or not to treat or to observe. And the second question, what is your opinion about the argon laser trabeculoplasty? I, I am, I am. Uh, well, no, I, Dr. Farak, we need just a very quick answer because I have a lot of questions and we still, the time is running very fast. Uh, Your talk is very interesting. That's why everybody is asking and Dr. Martin. Uh, yes. The question is, uh, what do I think of SLT? I think it's good. Is that short enough? Okay, very nice. <laughs> very interesting and very good. Direct to the point. Now we will have uh, my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Fayyad. Uh, he is going to, um, Dr. Fayaz Musa is an anterior segment specialist, cornea, glaucoma, refractive, Manchester and uh, Yorkshire in UK. Uh, we are honored and uh, to have you here with us. Just open your mic, Dr. Fayaz, then you can start this. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Amri, for inviting me uh, and to my colleague for Mr. Rafiq uh, uh, about this forum. Um, it's, it's really good actually to be in touch with other colleagues at this time in the UK everything is shut down as it is elsewhere um, and it's nice to nice to have this sort of a platform uh, so I've been asked to speak today uh, about the glaucoma side of things that I do I'm just getting this thing is my screen being shared okay there can you see it no, no not yet not yet sorry give me one second 
this your new laptop is make you a make a problem for you. you see. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll try it again. I'm, I'm pressing share screen. This is I tell you. Laptop is like a wife. Don't change. How is that? Is that working better now? Yes, you yeah, are now. Okay. okay. We are with you. It's okay, just, excellent. You excellent. All right, so um, I'll keep my, my talk short because I know we're running late. Uh, but I've been asked to speak on uh, on glaucoma, particularly with regards to non-penetrating glaucoma surgery. Um, obviously, I have experts already on the panel on this, um, but uh, I'll do my best to explain what I do and why I do it and what works and what doesn't. Um, so I prefer doing non-penetrating glaucoma surgery over trabeculectomy wherever I can. Um, and that's primarily because the post-operative management is a lot easier. Um, and uh, I feel that the outcomes, if managed correctly, are just as good if not better in some cases. Um, there are a number of tips and tricks to actually getting this surgery to work well. Uh, case selection is obviously very important, but also the most important thing uh, is really excellent uh, gonioscopic skills. Um, so uh, you know, I appreciate there's different people who are, are listening to this talk. So for the more junior colleagues, um, it's really important to decide where the corneal wedge is when you're doing your gonioscopy because that marks your Schwalbe's line. And really, it's, it's, if it's clear between Schwalbe's line and your scleral spur, i.e. the trabecular meshwork is, is clearly visible, then uh, non-penetrating glaucoma surgery, in particular deep sclerectomy, can be a very good option uh, for you. So in terms of my talk, uh, we'll move around a little bit. I always like to add in a few slides uh, of historical importance, talk about how, how the actual surgery works, which cases to select, which cases to deselect, we'll do a little bit of case-based discussions on a very simple case. We'll look at the surgical techniques, how best to, to manage things post-operatively. Uh, and as in most surgical things, the post-operative management is probably much more important than the actual surgical, uh, the surgical technique uh, in some ways. And we'll talk about uh, the case, its outcomes uh, as well. So, um, you know, although non glaucoma surgery goes through various phases and various fads and fashions, um, the idea of, of using surgery from the outside rather than the inside, you know, it's been going around now for 50 to 60 years at least. Um, it was described in 1962, where effectively a block of sclera is removed, uh, exposing large parts of the trabecular meshwork. And then this was further uh, emphasized uh, in a technique that's actually very similar to current deep sclerectomy techniques, where block of tissue is actually uh, excised uh, as well. So it's, it's not new, it's just a, a sort of an evolution uh, of an idea, an evolution uh, of a technique. Uh, the more the approach that we use now is very similar to what was described by Fyodorov in uh, the late 80s, where a block of tissue is removed, the trabecular meshwork is exposed, and you are left then with a scleral lake. Uh, which uh, assists in actually reducing the intraocular pressure. And a slight variation on that is the viscocanulostomy procedure. This varies with the deep sclerectomy in that the flap is tied quite securely and you're relying a lot on suprachoroidal drainage uh, as well as diffusion from the subscleral lake. Uh, with deep sclerectomy, there is uh, a fair degree of bleb drainage uh, as well as uh, suprachoroidal drainage. So talking about those sort of various drainage mechanisms now. So how does a deep sclerectomy work? Well, the most important difference is really this fine membrane that's kept as a very fine uh, spacer device. Uh, so not really a spacer device, but a resistance device between the anterior chamber and the flow posterior to that. Um, without that, really, you can get the problems that you get with trabeculectomies, which is you know, shallow ACs uh, and choroidals. So there's three main mechanisms. As I was saying, you get the subconjunctival drainage, you get the uh, suprachoroidal drainage, and you also get filtration out from where the scleral uh, lake is as well. So three main mechanisms there. In terms of choosing your candidates for surgery, go back to my first slide. Your technique of gonioscopy really needs to be excellent. Um, the higher myopes have, have deeper anterior chambers, uh, and therefore uh, the uh, chance of the trabecular decimate membrane window being blocked by the iris is much lower. 
pigmentary glaucomas. You can often see when you're peeling the trabecular meshwork, uh, when you're removing the pigment from them, um, you can get quite a rush of fluid. Uh, another advantage of non-penetrating uh, glaucoma surgery is that it's much less cataract formation. So generally for younger patients who are pre-presbyopes, this is a, a, an excellent technique. And again, similar to pigmentary glaucoma, pseudo exfoliative material, once it's removed, will allow fluid to pass through uh, the remaining trabecular meshwork much more easily. Uh, candidates who wouldn't do so well are patients really with uh, peripheral anterior synique, particularly superiorly, because that limits where you, where you can uh, place your TDM window, and it also increases the risk of iris prolapsing to that area. Uh, a lot of narrow angle patients, I'll remove the cataract or lens first, because these are generally hyperopic presbyopes, which refractively do very well uh, from removing of the lens, um, even with minimal cataract. Um, and then you can actually do a non-penetrating glaucoma surgery after that. Um, and we were talking earlier about ALT versus SLT. SLT is obviously quite gentle to the trabecular meshwork uh, and doesn't affect uh, the surgical procedure of, of peeling the TDM as much as ALT. After ALT, there's a lot more scarring and you can get macro perforations really, really quite easily. And I've done that once uh, uh, and had to convert to a, to a trabeculectomy. Uh, and obviously neovascular glaucoma is a, a definite contraindication for this type of uh, surgery. So I'll talk briefly about uh, this case. So we've got a 40 year old, they're a minus two myop. They're already on what to me is maximal topical medication, which is monopost and COSOP to, uh, preservative free. They've got an IP in the mid twenties. They've got disc cupping. They've got a uh, superior field loss that's progressive. Average corneal thickness, the presenting intraocular pressure was 36. Um, I'm not sure how interactive we can make this, Dr. Amri, but I was saying if anybody wants to sort of talk about any other things to consider. So two things really that you want to uh, consider doing. Yes, if you can ask this question here yeah, to our uh, other panels, if you have uh, questions, so they can interact with you. No, it's, it's more for the attendees rather than the panel members, but uh, we can we can go it through it. Because it will be very good. But if there is questions and you want to take an opinion and uh, opinion. No, no, it's, no, no that's, that's okay. So in terms, uh, so the things that you need to do in this case is uh, do the gonioscopy. Again, look for any neovascularization or peripheral anterior synique and obviously check the lens status. In terms of the technique of the surgery, um, it's uh, it's really, quite straightforward. You do a superior conge uh, and tenons flap. You do a super, superficial uh, scleral flap of, of around uh, 40 to 60% thickness. You take out a deep scleral block bearing the trabecular membrane, and you can peel that membrane either with a set of forceps or with uh, micro spears. And then you place a, uh, a spacer device and open the superior choroidal space. Uh, I, tend to, I tend to not actually close the superficial flap with anything at all now, I literally just re, re apposition it, and then just do two winging sutures for the conge and tenons. Um, that's it in real life. Uh, the, the spacer device that I use is a, an acrylic implant called a snoper. We can run through the surgery, we just get to the interesting bits. So this is dissection of the superficial scleral flap and then the deep scleral flap. So this is all relatively straightforward. The uh, skill and the experience comes into the, the part where you are bearing the actual membrane itself and deciding on how much flow is sufficient. So you can really see the aqueous coming out here and then peeling of the membrane. It's under very high magnification. Uh, that's why the focusing isn't always absolutely spot on. But if you can peel a nice membrane like that off the trabecular meshwork, then the chance of getting good flow and a good outcome is, is much higher. You remove the uh, deep scleral flap. And once you've done that, you open the suprachoroidal space in this area here, and you place the implant uh, and literally just reapposition the superficial flap, no sutures, and then just two winging sutures on either side. Uh, as I was saying earlier, the post-op management is uh, probably 
more important. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that on the next few slides. So if you're getting poor flow on the table, uh, one of the things that you need to consider early on is doing a YAG gonio puncture. Uh, show you a video of that in a second. Um, once you've done the YAG gonio puncture, you've effectively converted it to a penetrating surgery without any of the, the major risks uh, associated with things like trabeculectomies. Uh, and always one of the other adjunctive procedures you can use with this is a needle revision uh, in the same way that you would do with bleb management uh, after trabeculectomy. Uh, one of the risks following a YAG on your puncture is the iris actually plugging the uh, hole that you've made and for that you can use uh, argon laser to actually pull the iris uh, away from the hole that you've created and again we've got a little video for that so you know typical case you know in day day one uh, you'll have a, a very low intraocular pressure you know anything from you know two sometimes to to uh, even zero sometimes to ten uh, it's no problem at all, just as long as the anterior chamber is deep, um, uh, the pressure will gradually go up. Okay, please, can you just continue? Yeah. Um, uh, you wouldn't do anything at all at this stage. Um, you can sometimes get very shallow choroidals, um, but uh, again, there's not much of an issue with that. Uh, and let's say, oops, just going to go back one, sorry. Uh, let's say at week one, you've got uh, an intraocular pressure in the mid-20s, you've got minimal bleb. Um, the sort of things you check for there is to make sure the inner uh, trabecular, the, the inner window is clear. Uh, and at this stage, you could uh, quite easily do a YAG gonio puncture. Uh, at week two, uh, usually if your bleb morphology is good and your pressure is in a good target range, you don't need to do uh, much after that. I mean, one of the big advantages of these procedures of the trabeculectomies is that uh, the post-op management is a lot easier uh, and a lot less troublesome. So this is another quick video on uh, actually using uh, an argon laser to pull the iris away from a blocked uh, gonio puncture. So if you look carefully in this area here, you've got a plug of iris going into uh, a, a little hole in the trabecular meshwork. It's a very slow burn in the same way that you do sometimes for restructuring a pupil. And you can see the iris pulling away there. Let me do it again, slow motion again. So there's the actual yag gonio puncture there. And that's what it was like beforehand. So using the laser to actually uh, tighten up the iris and pull it away. And you can actually see the flow there as you're pressing, pressing on the external part of the eye. In terms of the yag gonio puncture itself, it's a little bit tricky focusing it because you're trying to get the two beams to focus at a slightly oblique angle. But the way I've been taught to do it and that I've been doing it for a long time now is uh, using the gonio puncture at either end of the TDM window. So you want to create a nice wide TDM window. And I often give patients pilocarpine. Okay. Yes, yeah, I give patients yeah, give patient. Patient. to make the iris tall and also to uh, lower the pressure slightly. That when you do have a gonyopuncture, you don't get a sudden rush of fluid uh, and pressure. Yes, please, you can continue. Okay. Okay, we can go to the discussion, or still you are having something? Yeah. No, 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 that's it. It's the last slide, actually. So, outcomes are very good. I'll leave those up for a short, uh, a short while. So, you know, you're getting, you're getting, you know, 70 to 80% success rates at uh, two to five years. So results are very good. Uh, and always after any of these talks, I always uh, refer back to my mentor and teacher, the experts expert, Mr. Anand, who, who taught me a lot about this procedure and ophthalmology in general. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fayyad. If there is any question from uh, uh, our uh, panelists here, Dr. Tarek, Dr. Omar, or Dr. Or Dr. Mazin, Dr. Yes. Any question, Dr. Yes, Dr. Yeah, please, Dr. Ali. Yes, have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, for Dr. Faisal, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, how much the lower uh, pressure you take with the uh, numb penetrating? Uh, you, you can. Get, you, you can get. Patients, or, or you can get patients into hypotony uh, with non-penetrating glaucoma surgery as well. So my, my, my outcomes are actually very similar to my trabeculectomy outcomes. 
So just as long as you manage it carefully, uh, you can get pressures that are extremely low. With this is lower uh, lower pressure. You didn't tell it. This is there is a micro perforation when you have uh, hypotony. Uh, in the early phases, I expect the pressure ideally to be below five because I use a very wide window and there's a lot of flow of aqueous. The only time that you'll get, if you get perforations and you haven't noticed it intraoperatively, then that's the only time we'll get a flat AC and choroidals. Uh, but it's, it, you can actually close over any micro perforations using uh, some sclera. Your traction is usually always on the same uh, place, or you didn't believe that this makes sometimes a detachment for the Schwalb line from the traction, or sometimes from the assistant is if make more traction on the traction is usually. Uh, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I've actually changed the way I do my traction sutures. That's a slightly older video. Before what I yeah, used to do the track, yeah, to, before what I used to do the traction sutures is, is as as you see there. Now what I do are two separate ones. At about two yeah. or three quarter hours apart. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, because therefore then you're not pulling on the TDM that you're trying to peel. Yep, that's that's well noticed. Yep, spot on. Uh, okay, we can move because we actually it's a very interesting uh, interactive uh, uh, sessions between different uh, colleagues, but uh, we are running behind the time, so we want to move now. We will keep the question till the end. I think is the best way, so we can have uh, select few questions that are very relevant. Uh, to the presentations. Uh, now we'll have Dr. Ali Al-Sheikh. Uh, mm -hmm. He's the MD uh, and Fakhas, uh, of consultant of pharmacologist and glaucoma surgeon at Nahda Hospital, Masqat Oman. Dr. Ali, you can start, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for this nice invitation. That's now. Yeah, what's up? Uh, can you please, Doctor? All other colleagues, can you can you just make yourself mute because we are hearing your okay. Now we can start, Doctor. Yeah. Okay. You can see my. Yes. Yes, Doctor Ali. We are. Yes, you are okay. Go ahead. This is now. This is uh, my uh, presentation for this case presentation. And uh, and five uh, fifty five year old gentleman referred for me for. Uh, Operation uncontrolled the glaucoma. This is in March two, uh, 2016 with IUB 26 on for anti glaucoma medication. But the patient complained from asymmetrical lashes and also decreased visual acuity. In the history, ocular history, there is YAG BI at the left eye from two years. This is if you can see here on the picture. I don't know why because the swag. A deep anterior chamber, but this is out of the country. Sometimes there is commercial uh, indication. If we look at the visual acuity at the left eye is 624 corrected to 69. The right eye is the better eye, but that's with visual acuity 660 and not corrected more. If we look here on the patient, we find this is allergy, long lashes on the left side, and compare with the right eye, the IUB at the left eye is 26, right eye 16. The patient, I think that's the doctor who was uh, given the treatment, start with Timolol, Brimo, and the Brenzolamide, and after that, add the Trabatan, and continue on Trabatan or Prostaglandin analogous because the patient was for one half year before on uh, Latanoprost, and after that, shifted to uh, Travoprost. And if we look at the cataract, cataract at the left eye, more significant with nuclear sclerosis plus two with subcapsular cataract, and compared to the right eye, only that means that the, uh, the cataract at the right eye not explain the visual acuity at the right eye. This is here the optic nerve at the uh, left eye with the advanced visual field defect with the low uh, nerve fiber layer. And compared to the right eye, good optic nerve, good visual field, but unfortunately with partial macular hole. The management for the left eye, at first for the right eye, because I didn't believe this is need the lower target pressure, I stopped the Primo and continue with the Azarga, but that's now the indication for the left eye. What is the best indication? Go only for trabeculectomy or mix, combine FACO with mix or combine FACO trabeculectomy or combine FACO with the glaucoma drainage device. 
what's available with me is trabeclectomy mix only i didn't have vexen or other only i have uh, a chance to try with the uh, kahook dual blade but i didn't think this is a good indication with glaucoma drainage devices at available ahmed glaucoma valve or this is combined the fac with trabeclectomy if we look this is at the study trabeclectomy is the best indication for lower for the, uh, decreasing the iob with this uh, multi-center analysis, decreased IUP till 12 in 80% without any glaucoma medication and 87 with the glaucoma medication. But the problem with the trabeclectomy, we need a close follow-up. On the patient, 31 of the patient need cataract operation. And this is also, and this is a study in, on my patient, 35 of uh, my patient, also, the visual acuity go back to the, to the same level in three months, but 28% of the patient need cataract operation in mean of 11 months. The problem with the trabeclectomy, we got a very good result, but we need a close follow-up. Of my patient here, seven plus one month visit in the first three months. This is the most important. But if we look at the result, it's very good result. The IOP before the treatment is 25 with almost four anti-glaucoma medication, decreased to around 13 with one glaucoma medication. If we look here on the glaucoma medication, 57 of the patient didn't need any glaucoma medication, a 20% one glaucoma medication. This is with almost 0 0.8 plus one, uh, minus one glaucoma medication over this three years. But if we make the cataract and after that we need the trabeclo uh, we make the trabeclectomy and after that we need the cataract operation. Is there an effect on the result? This study uh, show this is the cataract surgery after trabeclectomy will increase the risk of trabeclectomy failure. And this risk is increased if the time between trabeclectomy and cataract surgery is sh shorter. For that, if we thinking that we need cataract surgery in the first few months after trabeclectomy, it's better to go for combined surgery. But if we go for combined surgery, what the advantage and disadvantage? This is the meta-analysis study. In this meta-analysis, there is six study for the result of FACO with the trabeclectomy compared with the trabeclectomy. Show that this trabeclectomy decreased IOP significantly more than combined surgery and also the glaucoma medication. But what is the advantage? The complete successful rate and qualified successful rate was the same, not statistically uh, significant between trabeclectomy and combined surgery, and also the complication, and was the conclusion for this study, trabeclectomy alone is more effective in lowering IOP and glaucoma medication, but Two surgery cannot demonstrate statistically difference in the successful rate and incident of adverent incident. This is also on my uh, patient, 45 of my uh, eyes in 37 patient. Show this is the visual equity improve significantly from 0.2 to 0.45, and the IOB decrease significantly from 22 to around 15 and also decrease the anti-glaucoma medication from three to one glaucoma medication. Perhaps another one said, well, this is not exen. Exen is also a good indication. If we look here the, to this multi-center uh, study, we find that this exen decreased the IUB to around 14, and FACO exen to 13. And with, in the review of literature, and uh, most of the total of nine, uh, more than 90, 900 eyes, the IOB decreased with exen around 44% and with combined surgery 32%. Needling, needling is very important in this operation. We should inform the patient about that in this study around 32% and more uh, other study 40 or more than 40% need needling. For that, I go to combine surgery, FACO, with the trabeclectomy. As usual, I make the trabeclectomy, as standard trabeclectomy with the metomycin. This I here for the flap. And after that, go to for the cataract surgery, as usual, as standard cataract surgery. Two different 
site for the operation. After implantation, usually both the suture. After that, complete with the crescent, open and with bunch. Here, always I bought two loose fixed suture and depend on the two releasable suture, tight releasable suture to avoid any complication. I prefer always after combined surgery to be the IOP in the higher tens is better than to avoid any complication. And also meticulous clause for the conjunctiva with books also suture to avoid any leakage post operation. The patient was totally cooperative with close follow up. Good result was good, but the patient eight months after the surgery come ask about the visual, uh, improving the visual equity at the right eye. If we look here at the left eye, visual equity improved to 6.6 six, uh, at the left eye. IOB is 13 without any glaucoma medication. Right eye, IOB is 19 with Azarda, but uh, visual equity is still 660. Remember there was at the left eye, the pseudomacular hole. If we look here at the eyes for the patient, improved Obviously, at the left eye, if the long lashes is now improved. Also, the side effect on the lid also improved. If we look here, the patient on the left side, diffuse, flat blip, functional blip, and IOB is 13, but the right eye is significantly cataract. Now, what is the decision? Waiting, there is patient demand asking about surgery or go to FACO with Azarga, or FACO with vitrectomy and continue Azarga, or FACO with mix or combined FACO with the trabeclectomy. As glaucoma, always we need to wash our hand. We think in the situation for the, the for vitrectomy and ask the cons, ret, uh, retina consultant about that. The opinion was from the retina consultant is go for, there is partial macular hole, no intervention, reassessment after FACO. For that, I didn't think there is indication for trabeculectomy with this uh, early case on the, with the pseudomacular hole. That's now only I have FACO to and continue with Azarga or FACO with MIX. Unfortunately, MIX is not available, but I have the chance to free many free samples from uh, Kahuk Dual Blade. And if we compare Kahuk Dual Blade with I stain, both decreased IOP and com combined with FACO and around two millimeter and one medication. For this study, I stand decrease IOP around 14% and the Kahuk well around 12. And both the sister result for the study, FACO with the stent or gonutomy decreased IOP and number of anti medication. At a 12 month of follow up in patient with mild primary open angle glaucoma with no complication. For that, I go for FACO with Kahuk well black uh, gonutomy. I start with the Kahuk dual blade to avoid any corneal edema because that's the first many few cases I do with the Kahuk dual blade. We go with Kahuk dual blade on the Schlem canal. We see this is we remove the inner world from the Schlem canal. And this is here we open, we see and remove this. Is, and after that we finish, this is go to uh, normal uh, FACO. Only this, this advantage when start with the Kahuk dual blade. Now when decrease the IOP slightly, look at the nasal side. When go outside, start bleeding from the angle. That's good signs. But we can decrease the increase the IOP with the fisco elastic. No problem. Any decreasing come this is the bleeding. Can we watching on elevated the pressure inside the eye? No complication. This is after one week, the patient come, I will be 16 at the right eye, 14 at the left eye without any glaucoma medication. But that's the good news, the patient come and have you, um, but blaming me why this is the visual equity is so significant, improved. I, visual equity 6, 6 at the left, at the right eye. I look at the fantas, only I know there is wise ring. I send the patient for OCT. There is posterior BVD, there on the patient total BVD posteriorly and improve the macular buccar and silicone macular buccar uh, at the fundus. And this is here, 10 months at the right eye, IOP 15 without any glaucoma medication, left eye 13 uh, after 18 months at the first operation. See here, this goes slowly. 
yeah now this is here more uh, two years around two years this is uh, before many months this is here uh, for the, the right eye and left eye still the visual acuity if we look down six six at both eyes with without any correction at the right eye astigmatism minus 0.75 at the left eye the visual acuity is still six six only with the follow-up in the last visit i noticed it's a decreasing in the nerve fiber layer with increase the IOB to 18 for that I start Timolol to avoid any decreasing, more decreasing at the left eye. This is for the right eye before, and this is here for the uh, fundus for the, uh, the, left, uh, the right eye, sorry. If we look here, this is for the OCT. There is the macular hole, but this is paracentral or partial macular hole on this explain with the BVD, the visual acuity improve. Take home message, this avoid prescription, prostaglandin and anti anticlocoma medication at one eye in patient with bilateral glaucoma. Second, after stopping prostaglandin analogous eye drops, cosmetic side effect may be regressed even after a long time of using for prostaglandin analogous. Combined phacotrabeclopectomy is a good indication for advanced uncontrolled glaucoma associated with cataract. Combined FACO with MIX is good indication for mild to moderate glaucoma associated with cataract, but still we're waiting the long uh, time result. Visual acute prognosis after cataract surgery is in a glaucoma patient can be understanding, especially if associated with retina disease. We have as a glaucoma all know this is very rare to have a happy uh, patient, but we have happy patient, unlucky patient is this is very, very rare. Thank you for attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Ali. And now we can go directly to Dr. Omar Rafiq. Uh, Dr. Omar Rafiq is a consultant ophthalmologist, uh, specialist uh, in uh, glaucoma. Uh, and he was with us here in UAE. Now he left back to uh, UK. Uh, Dr. Omar also uh, is very specialized in a complex type of uh, glaucoma surgery. Uh, Dr. Amar, please. Yeah, I can't seem to be getting my presence. Salaam alaikum. I can't seem to be getting my presentation on for some reason. Okay, you try it, please. Can you okay, see it now? I have questions. If you are going to just try till we find the now of questions. Uh, we are having a few questions. Um, there was a question, wouldn't you consider checking the retinal thickening on B-scan prior to operation. This is a question for Dr. Khalid. Is Dr. Khalid still with us? Dr. Khalid? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you hear a question? Can you yeah, give me, ask your question? Can, can, you, can you say the question again? Uh, would, uh, wouldn't you consider checking retinal thickening on B-scan prior to operation? For sure. But, I mean, for the first case and the second case, we did the B-scan and we checked the the retina and choroid as, as well as the optic disc, okay. all with, with the normal. So. Uh, another question, Dr. Khaled, what about melting uh, that could happen in a graft around post and uh, grato, uh, prosthesis to avoid and how to avoid and to manage? Yes, melting, I, I think I, I uh, explained earlier that this is one of the main uh, problems with the, with the, with the post and grato prosthesis. Uh, excuse me, do you hear me? Yeah, we are with you. Yes, yeah. we can. So, 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 uh, melting is, is is one of the things can happen, and extrusion, and loss of the keratoprosis could also end up with the with the prosthesis. So, we can increase the lubricants as much as we can. We can put the uh, contact lens indefinitely. So, this is the the indicate the recommendation of the manufacturer of the Boston keratoprosis. If the ocular surface can tolerate the contact lens. And this is special contact lens. This is 16 millimeter diameter. We call it um, yeah, any larger uh, than the usual uh, contact lens we use with the 14 millimeter, 16 or 16 point, 16.5 millimeter of contact lens. We can use it to decrease the evaporation of the tear around the uh, keratoprosthesis and end, ended up with the uh, melting. So these the the measures of uh, even tarsorophy can help in some of the cases. Tarsorophy also can help. Like, so treating the dry eyes is really crucial for those of patients. Uh, Dr. Khaled, thank you. We are having one question before we start with Dr. Omar. This is to Dr. Tarek, please, Dr. Tarek. 
there is one question. I would like to know your opinion about staph incision glaucoma surgery. About what, sorry? What incision? Uh, staph incision glaucoma surgery. Stab incision glaucoma surgery? Yeah. I have no clue. S-I-G-S. S-I-G. Is there uh, anyone who knows? No, maybe maybe my, my other learned colleagues will, will be able to... Dr. Omar or Dr. Uh, uh, Fayyad, do you hear about IGS, glaucoma surgery? I know about MIGS, but not about SIGS. I don't know what... Uh, this is by Dr. Susan Jacob. It's done maybe. by Dr. Susan Jacob. Well, I think that's something that I need to go back and look on. Maybe I can learn something. But it's the first time I've come across. If Dr. Yeah, Tarek has heard of it, yeah, then I, I, yeah. I, I don't think I'd be expected. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I, I seem to recall something or another coming from India in one yeah. of the ICGS meetings, uh, maybe two is years it, ago. Something that was presented. Center. Yeah, something that was presented in Montreal in two years ago. But I have not practiced it. And to be very honest, I don't recall the, the, the steps or the results to be able to comment on it uh, in, any, in any meaningful way. Uh, also, we are having one other question, Dr. Omar, sorry, but uh, no you know, problem. Uh, there is diagnosis glaucoma in high myopia patient. There is uh, asking this question. Anyone can give answer, anyone, Dr. Ali or Dr. Fayyad, Dr. Tarek, or who want to, other who want to comment about this one. What is the question? Diagnosis glaucoma in high myopia patients. Here you should you should assess patient. You cannot depend on a, on in high myopia. You cannot depend on the OCT because this you cannot get any uh, reliable OCT. And also the visual field also cannot take as reliable visual field. But this is the advantage if this is for the visual for, uh, field for follow up. You should this is depend on the this is the IOB on this is another risk factor. But there is no evidence for to depend on any of the visual, visual field or OCT as an uh, other normal uh, patient. Can I, can I comment very briefly? Yeah, Dr. So uh, what Dr. Ali is saying is perfectly correct. Uh, in most cases of, of glaucoma in high myopes are diagnosed in relationship to high pressure, obviously increasing intracranial pressure. But the, the trick that I think is the most important thing is to look very well at the disc and document the disc. People look at the disc in, in regular cases and look at white and red, which to me is, is, is not very smart. The way to, to, to evaluate a disc is to put a virtual image of the rim uh, margin, margin of, of the disc, and then to follow the vessels as they move in and out of the disc. Once they change their course of, of direction, they're actually dipping inside the cup um, I would have pulled some photos, but maybe for next time. But this is the best way to look at cupping, is to look at the vessels as they go in and out, and not just to look at coloring, because that is very misleading. So the most important thing is to, to concentrate on uh, optic disc. These are the only things that you can monitor, I mean, the glaucoma in a high pitch. Uh, and, 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 and even that is not very easy to do. But uh, the trick is also to take disc photography. As Dr. Ali said, OCTs are not useful in these cases. So disc photography is a technology that is very cheap and is, is uh, you can actually evaluate very well using that. OK. So now we can have Dr. Omar. Then we will have uh, another few questions before we close this session. So Dr. Omar, please. Okay, good evening. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Can you hear me okay, Muhammad? Yeah, you are very good. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can I ask so, mute, please, before Dr. Omar, so we can hear all the So, thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, mine is going to be kind of touching uh, on advanced glaucoma, but quite nicely will fit in very well with what Dr. Tarek spoke about and we'll talk about ocular surface as well. Um, so, we'll talk quickly about a small clinical case the importance of preservative-free anti-glaucoma medication and also preservative-free lubricants and the long-term uh, ocular surface instability that we get with these patients. So this was a 19-year-old female. Um, she presented with right eye pain, had been to see quite a few 
uh, different ophthalmologists. And um, unfortunately, this, this young lady had a two year history of uh, using steroid eye drops over the counter. Um, this lady thought that uh, they were lubricant drops. Uh, and it, it is quite a shame, but um, it, you know, people do tend to use steroids and they feel as though that they either they're extremely scared of them. So when you're trying to give them, uh, they are very hesitant or you've got the other extreme where they uh, will use them nearly willy. Um, so unfortunately this, this, this girl had been using these lubricant drops. There were some vague history of multiple episodes of uveitis. So I was very suspicious is this, um, you know, some kind of uveitic masquerade syndrome. Uh, on presentation, uh, she was on no medication. Uh, IOP was 51 in the right eye and 36 in the left. Uh, she was extensively cupped in the right eye. The left one seemed fine. Uh, vision was still 66 in both eyes, but the 66 was pinhole in the right eye. She had an RAPD uh, and uh, 300 degrees, 60 degrees PAS on the right eye. That hence explained the very high pressure. Um, don't know how long she'd had this pressure for, uh, but there was thinning globally on the OCT scan. And even though you know we know what the images are going to look like, especially in a case like this, you want to get a baseline. Um, she had gross loss um, on the visual field test on perimetry, but there was nothing gross uh, on the left eye. So this is an octopus image of uh, her visual field. And also once again, her um, disc uh, structurally. Um, so I was very hesitant with this girl and uh, we decided to investigate it systemically as well to rule out uveitic syndromes. Um, in the primary instance, it was very important to control her intraocular pressure. Um, and so we gave a topical anticlocoma medication and oral diamox. She had no contraindications. And so we put her on maximal treatment. And this goes very simply with what we were talking about earlier, where nowadays we have, um, you know, I, can, I try to really minimize the number of medications or rather the number of drops that I can give to these patients. So we can now give them uh, a combination of all four maximal drops with two, two bottles. Um, and so that's what she had. Uh, she had Ganfort at nighttime and Simbrinza twice a day. Uh, the next day, the pressure had dropped, um, but she was on oral diamox. So we thought, okay, let's just continue and buy some time. Let's see how this is gonna pan out, get some uh, of the results back. What do you do next? Um, so she, uh, and, and, and I know at some stage with these patients, I am going to be planning surgery, but in my own mind, I'm kind of trying to uh, buy some time for her, control the situation. And as we know, we don't really want to operate on a hot eye, so unless we absolutely have to. Um, and also when I'm on the slit lamp, I will put some anesthetic drops and I will try and play around with the conjunctiva to some extent to gauge an idea um, as to how much and what I've got to play with in, in surgery. And I'm also conscious that this girl has some, uh, was it GIA, some kind of history of uveitis. And we know in these patients that penetrating surgery, to recollect to me in particular, the success is going to be limited. Um, so I actually discussed this case with quite a few of my uh, colleagues in the UK as well, a lot of my mentors during my fellowship. Uh, I felt the right thing to do. And we know, you know, with these kind of patients, these uveitic um, patients that, uh, uh, they will do very nicely with the tube surgery. I think doing a trabeculectomy, it did occur to me. However, I thought this is, it's going to fail. And I've got one real good chance. And if you really want to control this situation, then you'd go for what you really want to do. So I um, inserted an Ahmed valve under general anesthesia. Day one, that was her pressure. But interestingly, um, we know this syndrome occurs in children where they have, uh, for whatever reason, the optic nerve is uh, much more stronger but she had a reversal. So this was, these are her disc images, the right eye you can see, and then the left eye looked relatively normal. But immediately day one uh, after surgery, the, there was kind of um, reversal of the cupping uh, in the right eye. And we've seen this in children, uh, we're, but she's 19. So uh, it was a bit strange, but probably uh, looking in the literature, it has been reported before, but quite unique. Um, now, Week two, however, the pressure started to raise again um, at 27 in the right eye. So we um, put her back on a combination dropper, prostaglandin and a beta blocker. Um, but week three, the IOP was raising in. And so I was constantly looking and seeing, it's a bit too early. 
um, you know, because you immediately after tube surgery, you would actually expect some kind of a hypotonic, especially with leakage around the tube entry point and various things. Um, but I guess with her, and the big learning point is the amount of gross inflammation that these patients have. And learning point, unless you control the inflammation, you're not going to control the disease process. So uh, we commenced on uh, oral steroids. I was uh, discussing, and she was in joint management with my consultant rheumatology colleague uh, as well. Uh, post steroids, uh, a couple of days later, the IOP had dropped down to 19. She was more comfortable. Um, um, we kind of knew we were heading in the right uh, area with this patient. She then um, had been confirmed ANA positive, um, and we knew that we were heading for systemic immunosuppression. Uh, being a, um, a young lady of childbearing age, we obviously that limits as to what we can give her. So she was commenced on his thyroid, um as well. There was some poor patient compliance, which is sometimes uh, the case, unfortunately. Um, and so we had to continually educate this, this uh, young lady and especially the family uh, as well. But I'm pleased to say that she's actually doing very well. Once we've controlled her, um, she's now about 18 months post-surgery. Uh, I saw her last week. And she's doing very well. She is still on a, a combination drop. Uh, pressure's around about 13 now, but very comfortable. And uh, so these young patients, they, they do tend to have, especially with these kind of patients, an aggressive secondary glaucoma. But in uh, one of the things that I'm very keen, especially in terms of her age, is preservative free. Um, you know, we have an era where we have, you know, I, I talk about this before again and again, the lubricant market, we have lots of preservatives. Uh, free medication, but the glaucoma, we were slightly lagging behind. We have more options now, uh, limited still, but I think that will get better. Um, so it's all about minimize the level of ocular toxicity. Remember that she's a 19 year old. So at some stage we may need to intervene, but at this moment we can salvage the situation and make sure we're minimizing the amount of, um, you know, kind of the preservatives that are going into the eye. So longer term use in these patients or preservative free lubricants as well. And incidentally, in this patient, I actually had her on restasis as well, and she's done very, very nicely. Um, so insufficient IOP control on preservative-free glaucoma meds, hence you kind of will have to sometimes use a, a combination of maximum treatment. But I found that once the inflammation can settle, you can slowly taper off the glaucoma medication. Um, you know, and we all know that poor ocular surface contributes to poor surgical outcomes. We, we've already spoken about the TVT study uh, where vision can be compromised. And remember, you've got a big plate inside the eye, so there will be induced astigmatism. Uh, she has inflammation as well, ocular surface, uh, you know, dry eyes. So there's lots of variables. It's not just about controlling the intraocular pressure. It's about, um, you know, treating the patient as well as the eye. Um, so preservatives, you know, they, they are there to decrease contamination. Um, they are multiple types, and we'll talk about them, but they have lots of harmful effects, ocular discomfort, instability, uh, you know, conjunctival changes, ocular surface changes. So these, this is very important to bear in mind. You know, you've got back, you've got SOC, sodium perborate. And remember, a lot of these agents, they are what we found in household disinfectants. So, and this is what we're actually giving to our patients to put in the eye. It's sometimes, and unfortunately, a necessary evil. And so generally the order of decreasing toxicity at the most common use concentration is thigh and then back uh, with EDTA there. Um, but preservative-free lubricant use, you know, they are generally safe to use. Uh, as you, If you need, I think the kind of consensus is if, if one of your patients is having to use lubricant drops more than four times uh, a day, then preservative-free is the way to go forward. I don't know what the panel thinks, but I prefer, even if they're not using them more four times a day, I will still personally prefer to go for preservative-free as a first line. Um, I can't see a reason not to, especially in this day and age, uh, especially with the amount of, you know, the computer vision syndrome, with the air conditioning, uh, especially the part of the world that I've just left, the UAE. And so, you know, we are constantly, you know, having um, the amount of dry eyes that is in all our clinics is very significant. Uh, so I would kind of turn around and say that uh, preservative free is the way to go. Um, these kind of cases are very challenging and very complex. What you can see in front of you are different types of tubes. You've got the Ahmed, you've got the Barbell, you've got the Maltino, various other tubes. You can also have an Ahmed, which um, 
you can put in with a plate at 90 degrees uh, if you're going to do a vitrectomy, which I have done. And I know uh, Dr. Khalid was talking about the Boston prosthesis and corneal transplants, but those are some of the cases where if they have a secondary glaucoma, then instead of putting the tube in the anterior chamber, you can either put it in the sulcus or you can put the plate uh, after a core vitrectomy in the vitreous uh, chamber. And they tend to do very nicely. They have to have a core vitrectomy, of course. Um, so, and that's essentially, you'll know what, what they look like. Uh, so they're difficult cases, um, but they are challenging, but they're also worthwhile when you control them. But a multidisciplinary team approach needs to be had, uh, not just with yourself, but you, know, you really need to talk these cases out, especially with your rheumatology colleagues in these inflammatory cases. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Omar, uh, for these very interesting also topics. All the presentation are an excellence and they are direct to the point. Uh, we will have a few questions because already we are so late. I know most of us, we are become tired and we also our attendees. Um, so we'll go directly to a few questions. Uh, I will start from the beginning. I don't know, this is for Dr. Khaled. What about melting that could happen in the graft? Uh, this one already we have um, answered this one, sorry. Um, we are having, uh, why are you rushing for a trabeculectomy with or without cataract surgery? I have experience with only cataract surgery in glaucoma patients. Some of them open angle as cataract surgery, improving the control of IOP. I think this for Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, can you open your mic and answer or give a comment about that? Sorry, please uh, repeat again. Uh, the question I... is why you are rushing to do a combine and instead maybe sometimes if you do a cataract alone, it may also yeah. give uh, and control the intraocular pressure itself without doing a combine. For, for this patient is uh, for the combined surgery, the patient already had nuclear sclerosis, a plus two with subcapsular cataract. Uh, we, we know this is almost of the patient increased the cataract a few months after the uh, trabeculectomy. With this patient, if we make trabeculectomy, this is true. We take a better result with decreasing IOB, but if we need uh, FACO, uh, we need uh, FACO after the trabeculectomy, after the trabeculectomy, the IOB, we have a very high risk for uh, for trabeculectomy failure. If we start with FACO only, the FACO in this case with open ankle glaucoma will not decrease the IOB. And also we have any risk with uh, high I, uh, IOB spike after FACO will lose the more of the optic nerve head. In this case, we cannot start to make FACO. The indication here, our leader to the OT is the glaucoma. Here we decide is trabeculectomy okay. plus minus the FACO, but uh, in this case, with FACO is better. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Uh, can I ask their colleagues only just to have a, a very short answer because we are having many. So this is a question for Dr. Khalid. How do you calculate of pressure in a case you are doing a prosthesis? Very interesting uh, question. Very interesting uh, question. And this is one of the dilemma we have a pro uh, with the with the keratoprosthesis. prosthesis. There is no way to uh, accurately and precisely uh, measure the intraocular pressure uh, post uh, post keratoprosthesis. prosthesis. We usually uh, depend on the digital uh, digital um, uh, feeling, and uh, most of the uh, I mean experienced surgeons and they they know how if, if the patient is really having a problem with the high IV or not. And and we are doing the the nerve fiber layer as well as the visual field. To just monitor the uh, other okay. visits in the triad of the. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khaled. Okay, Dr. Ali, also this question for you, but also please a very short answer. Uh, what is your experience in the long term result of uh, Kahook blades? This is, uh, I, I have only the experience with a few cases. This is a difference from patient to other patient. This is for this example, for this patient after three years, the UB uh, slightly go higher, um, more and more uh, up. For that, we didn't have a experience for more, uh, my experience more than three years. Perhaps Dr. Tari, I have experience more than uh, me. Any experience can give a comment about this one? Any other colleagues? 
uh, Kahoot Blade is not a, a device that has been there for a long while. I've been using it in, in some settings with some excellent results. Uh, and I have actually started uh, an MD thesis for one of my, um, one of my fellows uh, where we are comparing uh, primary medications versus uh, Kahoot Blade, a very you know, uh, preposterous or brave, whatever you would like to call it, uh, 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 you know, protocol, and will be hopefully we'll be able to provide some data later on. But I, I, my gut feeling is that is it's it's quite an interesting procedure. Okay, this question uh, I think maybe for Doctor Omar, uh, would prostaglandin drop uh, increase the inflammation? I think if it's uh, any drop can increase inflammation, especially if it's got preservatives in. So if it's a prostaglandin uh, analog medication with benzalkonium, then yes, we know it's not the drop itself, it's the actual uh, additives that are in there. Uh, so uh, that's hence one of the reasons why we have prostaglandin analogs with preservative-free medication. Um, so I, I, like I said, and I think the panel probably will share this as well, preservative-free is always the first line to go if you have the option available to you because as a glaucoma surgeon, what you're worried about is not necessarily nice surgery day one. What you're really trying to augment and ensure is success of surgery later on down the line. So we can, I have seen surgery, you know, trabecolectomy blebs fail very, very quickly and also very late as well. So it entirely, and if you're planning to do surgery uh, in a patient, I have sometimes known to stop all the drops just to give the eye to some time to settle down, put them on oral diamox if they're okay, and just some steroid drops as well. So the IOP is, is controlled, and it gives me a couple of weeks for the eye to settle down, and therefore you're not operating on a hot, angry red eye because the success of surgery would be greatly affected. Okay, thank you, Amar. Also, there is this question also for maybe for you or for Dr. Ayad. Uh, uh, Ayad. Um, would you recommend routine use of preservative knee drops uh, only in all cases to preserve conjunctiva integrity in case for future trabectomy instead of for indeed for the patients? My answer is simple, yes, if you can. Yes, this is a very nice answer, which gives us a very quick answer. There is a lot of people that are also follow us in YouTube and we have many questions. Uh, which one is better uh, in detecting uh, morphological changes uh, OCT or HRT, uh, this one in question from you, uh, YouTube, I think. For the... Anyone can answer this one? Which one is better in detecting morphological changes? I think, I think this is related to glaucoma. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think the, uh, I think that HRT is, uh, has been a, a very interesting device, but now I would say that OCT has surpassed it in terms of, uh, quality of, of, uh, of software that is available now and, uh, and accuracy of, of diagnosis. So I think OCT has more or less overcame HRT a few years ago. Uh, this is very good uh, also question to Dr. Khalid, uh, but already he answered, he, he, he said, uh, if you, do you depend on, uh, 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 I mean, for measuring the, the intraocular pressure, you say only digital. Um, if you feel, for example, hard or soft, then are you going to prescribe medication depends only on uh, by touching the eye or by palpations? Yeah, yes, yes, and there is, there is so many reports to uh, know that there is a crowding in the anterior chamber and the chance of high IOP post posting keratobrosis is high. There is uh, more than five, five or six uh, papers proving that there is escalation of intraocular pressure after uh, implanting this type of pr prosthesis. So many, many of these uh, prosthesis are uh, on medication. Like my patient, she was in two medication, uh, like uh, Cosopt or Zolamol, and she was kept on that long time. And also even some of the uh, uh, doctors, they are doing um, uh, combined procedure, post-incarate prosthesis and the Ahmed valve or any, any type of valves uh, to uh, decrease the chance of losing the vision post post keratoprosis. procedure. This is one, one of the main indication, one of the reasons why the patients might lose their vision uh, after implanting uh, these type of processes. So uh, glaucoma is high chance and we 
do give uh, anti-glucoma so for so many of these uh, patients if they didn't do uh, glucoma surgery. And the only glucoma surgery we do uh, Ahmed valve implantation. I think uh, uh, we'd like to conclude this session. I would like to thank you all dear colleagues and all the attendees. Uh, we are so late. So good night for everyone. And we'll see you inshallah on Friday for another webinars for anterior segment. It will be mainly cataract and cornea refractive. Thank you all. And see you inshallah soon. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Shukran, Dr. Okay. Farah, all of you. Dr. Khaled, Dr. Fayyab, Dr. Omar, Dr. Mazin, and all others. Dr. Ali, Sheikha, sorry, and all. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.